Hello, my name is Chrissy Thornton, and I'm here from Associated Black Charities with August 2024 Equity at Work. And as you can see, I have some very esteemed panelists who have joined me on screen, and you'll hear more from them very shortly. Every month, Associated Black Charities is proud to bring this webinar experience to you so that we can navigate the ways that structural racism shows up in the workplace and to give guidance, resources, and discussion around how Black professionals can navigate those uh, structural barriers, but also how corporations and allies who have a desire to be more inclusive can step into that work as well. So today we plan to talk about building a culture of inclusion. Building a culture of inclusion is fundamental to creating an equitable and thriving workplace. For Black professionals, this culture fosters a sense of belonging, where diverse voices are valued and empowered. It acknowledges and celebrates the unique perspectives and experiences Black professionals bring, enhancing innovation and success. By ensuring everyone feels respected and supported, organizations can harness their workforce's full potential, leading to more dynamic and effective teams. But we believe that building a culture of inclusion requires dedicated effort from all organizational levels. Leaders have to model inclusive behaviors and hold themselves and others accountable. By embedding inclusion into the core values of an organization or a company or a business and its operations, there can be the creation of workplaces where Black professionals and ultimately all professionals, all employees can thrive, can innovate, and can contribute meaningfully. So welcome to Equity at Work. And I have with me today, Dr. Chanel Whitaker and Carlo Young. And we would love to hear from both of you, not just about yourselves, but why you feel like today's discussion around building an, a culture of inclusion is so important today. And we'll start with you, Chanel. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that, um, you know, really setting the stage for our conversation. And so my name is Chanel Whitaker. I am um, a professor and also our inaugural assistant dean for equity, diversity, and inclusion at the University of Maryland School of Pharmacy, which is at the University of Baltimore. There's lots of Baltimore campuses in Maryland. So I will say we are housed in Baltimore City in West Baltimore. <laughs> so we get the right campus. Um, but I have been practicing and uh, teaching for over about 20 years now, for about 20 years. Um, but to share a little bit about my story, because I think that's important to, to connect with the audience, that um, I grew up in, in a, a community similar to West Baltimore, right? Under-resourced and, and really highly segregated. I grew up in Brooklyn, New York. And while the community was, was highly diverse, again, my classrooms, were um, very segregated, right? I'm not gonna say predominantly black and Hispanic. It was 99.9% .9 uh, black and Hispanic, oh, wow. you know, the students um, that I attended school with. So highly segregated and, and certainly th this was by design, right? Um, we have maps to prove that how certain communities have been, um, have been uh, segregated throughout, uh, throughout history and it's still the impacts are still there today. But I say all that to say that um, as I journeyed through my career after high school, that 99.9% .9 turned into maybe 5% of me being reflected in predominantly white spaces in universities and also um, as I practice and in higher education. So, you know, I, I say all that to say, you know, share a bit of my story to say it's important to me uh, because if we can create systems of inequity, right, that impact communities impact workplaces and ultimately society where it becomes normal, right? Uh, that I am not reflected on a faculty normally, and then we can also create systems of equity uh, where we see everyone equally reflected around um, and our communities also reflect that equity in our workplaces also as well. So I think we can do it deliberately, right? Where we can really experience that benefit uh, of diversity in the workplace. Amazing, we're so glad to have you with us today. And Carlo, we'd love to hear from you. Greetings. My um, name is Carlo Young. I'm the president of Concentric Educational Solutions. We're an ed tech company based here in Baltimore. We're really working chronic across the country um, on this big issue of chronic absenteeism that is kind of plaguing our school. Big issue before the pandemic, exposed to crisis post pandemic. We work to help kind of help remove barriers for students in kind of K-12 and really help students understand, 
you know, how do we empower them to see their full potential? So helping them find pathways to post-secondary outcomes could be college, could be something different, but our job is to really understand these students and show up in a, you know, I'll call it a mentoring capacity, um, using some ed tech tools to really help kind of propel them into the, you know, successful outcomes, if you will. Um, if the question is a great question, like why is this important, if you will, to me personally? Um, I think in some ways, shape or form, I've been doing equity work since I was a kid. Um, my parents grew up in East Baltimore. I grew up in East Baltimore. And they, I think they modeled um, me being able to see, my brother being able to see, you know, them advocate on behalf of others, um, fight for what's just, you know, fight for fairness kind of. And I, I watched that as a kid and I could see them not just doing it for themselves in a selfish kind of way, but but looking out for the village, the community, right? You know, really being able to look look after others. So I found myself stumbling into different roles, you know, kind of in high school. I was uh I went to the Gilman School here in Baltimore and um, ended up being president of the Black Student Union. And then uh, you know, fast forward to college, was heavily involved in uh NSBE, National Society of Black Engineers, then professionally here, uh, when I moved back to Baltimore, president of the National Association of Black Accountants in NABA. And have found myself either kind of in some leadership role in some employee resource group, but some people on this on the call might be familiar with that term. We'll probably talk about that today. But in these large firms like Deloitte and KPMG, uh, kind of held leadership roles. And um, and then further on, I moved into this ed tech space. The last company I was with was 2U. I was executive sponsor of our Black Engagement Network. It was the largest employee resource group in the company uh, with over a thousand members. And we really wanted to set the bar high relative to the work mm -hmm. that we and, and as an executive sponsor, my job really was to think about not just helping to guide the leadership team as they kind of drive on different initiatives, but also to be that intervention, to be that voice in the executive room, right? To be able to kind of, and we'll talk about that today. So I live by this mantra of lifting as we climb. And I, a lot of the work that I think about is like, we're all, uh, if you think about others, um, and I got lifting as we climb, that came from my work in NABA. It's really thinking about as I'm excelling in my career, I want to pull, kick the door down and pull a bunch mm -hmm. of Right. You know, and that's a, a lot of those folks are black and brown, but I kind of here to help to support everybody. Right. All different types of, um, you know, elements of diversity, if you will. Amazing. Thank you for being here as well. So let's dive right in. Is, is that OK? Absolutely. All right. We're going to talk today about building a culture of inclusion in the workplace. And one of the things I like to do to level set is to make sure we share common terminology. And so I wanted to talk about inclusion. I'm going to give you some kind of like textbook definitions of what inclusion in the workplace looks like. But then I would like to hear from you on not only what it looks like to you all, but what it feels like. I think too often we talk about technically what something should be and not what it feels like and what people's lived experiences are. And so here, here's what I researched. It says that where there is inclusion in a workplace, there is a sense of belonging. That means people's voices are valued, their perspectives are not only heard, but integrated into decision-making. There's diversity. And in that diversity, there's empowerment, right? Like, so diversity, not just for the sake of it, but people feel empowered to share, to contribute, to take ownership. There's equitable hiring and advancement, right? So we're talking about unbiased hiring, unbiased promotional opportunity, um, transparency in career trajectory for um, marginalized communities, people of color, black people. Continuous learning and professional development opportunities. And lastly, which I probably think is the most important, there's the opportunity for open dialogue, right? There are safe spaces for Black professionals. And, you know, we, we are going to focus on Black professionals because that's our mission assignment. But we could interchange that with um, aging professionals, with, you know, Latino and, uh, you know, queer professionals, with disabled professionals. Um, but there are open uh, dialogue opportunities for people to share their experiences, to perhaps complain to raise issues where that becomes necessary and to uh, contribute to the organization's growth in those areas. Is that how you all would, de would define inclusion? Is there anything that's been left out or what do you think? All right, so I will add, um, when I think about inclusion as well, as a health professional, I also think about the communities that we serve, right? Whether you uh, work particularly in a community or you're in a healthcare setting, right? Um, whether it be a clinic or a big health system, hospital, emergency room. So I think inclusion is incredibly important. And I think that goes to a self-awareness and actual education about how to create an inclusive space when you're working with, you know, for example, that patient. I think sometimes, you know, um, 
under the guise of we're all nice people, right? We don't clearly define what are behaviors, right? That are appropriate, right? There are behaviors that we can practice and we can teach our students so that they are creating um, as safe a space as possible for the patients that they see, um, you know, when they're in clinic, particularly when it is across uh, racial lines or other racial lines or other um, identities. So I would add um, that part just from the aspect of, you know, when you're providing a service to the community. Absolutely. Carla? Yeah. I, I think you hit it. You, those are like great kind of uh, representation of inclusion. I think in many ways, right, you, you're 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 nailing it. Like people want to be. This is humans, right? Like we all want to be seen. We want to be heard. We want to feel valued. We want to be safe, right? Like so. Let's let's play that out, if you will. Um, and I, I don't know if uh, the Honorable Tony Terrain is on the call today as a as an employment <laughs> um, attorney expert, if you will. But um, but he would tell you that there's some EEOC requirements and maybe some OSHA requirements in terms of safety and harassment, if you will. But but let's go take this back to like you know we've all probably seen. Hello, Tony. <laughs> <laughs> We probably all have seen at some point uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, right? And you think about the physiological kind of needs kind of at the, the base root, then the safety needs. And then you start getting to this place of like love and belonging, right? And you start moving up the ladder, if you will. Um, most of our folks, you know, you think about the the challenges, like the way you articulated, Christy, was like perfect. I, what I would tell our team at 2U, the, our Black Engagement Network, as we thought about our mission relative to the employee resource group, like where can we have an impact, right? Yes, we want to create a space for, for culture and a lot of fun things, if you will. But we also want to be part of like tying what we do back to the business goals. How do we tie what we do back to the business goals? We want to have our voices heard. We want to seat at the table. You got to tie it back. So where can we play a role in recruitment of Black talent, right, to the company? Where can we play a role in retention of Black talent in the company? <clears throat> you know, where can we play a role relative to the culture of the entire company, right? Where do we where do we infuse and bring our special sauce to the to the party and really get people moving, if you will? Where can we think about training our employees? You know about that advancement notion, if you will. Um, and we'll get into that a little bit. You know, a lot of organizations um, in lived experiences, you'll see, you know, perhaps the individual contributors of the company might might look diverse. Like some some company can mask that diversity because oh wow, like twenty percent of their employees are diverse, and you look at well. 19% of those folks are, are sitting at the individual true letter level and then only 1% are VPs right. and right? And like, so how do we think about, you know, what training can we provide to, to individuals mm -hmm. to think about advancing their careers? And that whole career advancement piece, um, where can we be strategic in driving internal mobility, um, right opportunities, um, make sure people are, are put on the right engagement, the large accounts, if you will, um, the high profile clients, you know, maybe in, in Chanel's, uh, you know, case and how do we ultimately drive that? And then what I'd always say to the team is like, where can we drive product innovation and business impact? That company is an ed tech company that's focused on online programs and the team would look puzzles and like, Carlo, like we, we do this with, you know, um, you know, Harvard university and, you know, uh, Cal Berkeley and USC and NYU, where can we really make a, make a stamp there? We can help. We try to get more black students in this program. We're, I was like, why don't we just, why don't we think about a program for black students? Why don't we just do that, if you will? And we, we came up with um, an idea around Morehouse College Online to create a, a space for black men to be able to finish this undergraduate degree completion program. So this is helping these black men who have some college credit, no degree, to really be able to finish their degree at a high quality institution like Morehouse College. And we built that program and a lot of that influence came from that um, ERG. And then they were able to see the light of like, oh wow, we actually can think about this. But you think about a consumer products company might say, we got to develop hair care products for black women. And that needs to go on the shelf because the Vidal Sassoon, excuse my language, may not <laughs> address the way that I needed to, right? So if you will. So I think there's always a way, to, the, the more you can get into the business imperative and tie it back to business goals, mm -hmm. That ultimately helps with the inclusion aspect of, of all the, of how we show up. So let's talk a little bit though about, um, and we'll talk extensively about what the opposite of inclusion looks like and how that shows up. And we would love for people who are watching to share your experiences in the chat so that we can add those to, to the discussion. Um, what I want to say though, is that I remember being in roles and working on jobs where I would leave the job and be psychologically harmed, mm -hmm. right? I remember working in spaces where I would leave the job and cry all the way home. Um, the level of harm that Black and other professionals face when the environment is not inclusive 
is extensive. So I want to talk a little bit about that. What are some ways that you feel that cultures that aren't inclusive harm Black professionals? So you want to go first? <laughs> I, I will. I will go first, and I'm I'm going to channel it through a little bit through my experience, right? Um, I, you know, obviously I've been a student um, and I'm, I'm just gonna share as I go gone up um, and with my career. So I'm gonna say as students, right? And also I've heard this from other students, there is this invisibility, right? Where you are kind of there, but no one, you know, sort of notices that you're there. And I think often um, opportunities come through people. And as a student, you know, you're kind of there trying to get your education, but often you get new opportunities. You know about this fellowship program, et cetera, through some um, faculty member who knows about said program. But if you sort of invisible in that space, you might not have that right connection and have that right access to those opportunities. That's gonna help to really, um, you know, get you on the path to where you're seizing those opportunities to continue to grow, right? So that's one of, an example of invisibility as a student, but also on the other side, you know, there is this hyper visibility. Um, I will use that particularly for health profession students when uh, we have these policies, um, I'm gonna use the word policing a little bit um, because where we see someone, let's say who has some tattoo on their arm, but we don't see others or we have see, you know, a, a person with some different colored extensions in their hair, but we don't see someone with a, you know, with different colors in their hair. So there's this invisibility and also hyper visibility. And that is something that's definitely harmful, but it, it shows up um, in different ways, right? Um, and this turns into um, someone might be uh, reprimanded, for example, in, in a setting where they have to be graded, right? And that impacts their grade and ability to, uh, to progress. Um, I would also say, you know, as you're um, kind of moving along in your career, especially in academia, healthcare spaces, um, again, relationships really do matter in terms of opportunities, but also in terms of growth and development. There is this hidden curriculum um, that sort of, if you don't know the people to share that information with you, right? So how do you get promoted? Um, certainly in spaces where, um, you know, people going after academic roles, that was an area where I really struggled, right? I always felt like I didn't quite have all the information I needed to be successful, but it wasn't a secret. It just kind of was hidden uh, for me. And you need another, you know, maybe senior faculty member to tell you how it works, right? There's criteria on paper, but then there's also processes and how they're carried out, right? Have you really been shared that kind of hidden curriculum about how to really be successful and, and get promoted, um, et cetera? So that's a couple of examples. Um, and also leadership roles, I will add that. And then I'm sure Carla has many um, great examples, uh, but with leadership roles, right? Who has access to uh, this leadership role that's opened up? Am I prepared to take on that leadership role? Because if I am not in relationship with someone who's been in leadership, I don't really know all the ways that I need to be successful, right? There's a position description, but there's ways that you know you need to understand to, to be successful. So I think those are some of the ways that I'm, I'm thinking about, uh, but you know, I'm sure Carla has, has more. Yeah. Yeah. I think anyone who's felt, I mean, you both have, have uh, shared some unique insights. I think anyone who's felt part of, like, I always walk up, walk around thinking about, like, I can see the people who, are, who have been othered. I, I, I know what that experience looks like. So part of the reason I've done a bunch of diversity work is because I can look at all, I can look at the women in the room. I can look at the folks that, that I may know, <clears throat> or they may be personally, you know, kind of uh, explicitly, um, you know, okay with sharing the orientation, sexual orientation, I can see that and I know what that feels like to be othered, right? So when you are part of the other group versus the in group, um, that does have psychological harm, right? It does prevent, you know, um, certain opportunities at times, right? Where um, as Chanel kind of, you know, do you get picked for the right opportunity? Do you get a chance to, if you think about why do people show up in the workplace and, you know, um, I wanna grow in my career, oftentimes I wanna get skills, I want to be challenged. Um, I want to accumulate some type of wealth or salary, if you will. And if you are stymied for one way or the other, right, because you're not getting the right skills, right, you're being pigeonholed to, hey, just go do this thing over here. Um, I don't even see you. I don't see your potential in doing this thing. And I told you my business is all about seeing potential, right, seeing these these gyms and the neighborhoods that Chanel and I grew up in, right, and being able to say, how do we see that gem and how do we help them get to their potential? How do you go from the 99% to the 5%, if you will? <clears throat> Excuse me. And then oftentimes um, that 
that psychological harm, and it goes back again. I'm not all big on Maslow, but 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 the, but it's true. As you move up that hierarchy, it gets more challenging. It gets more challenging, right? So as you get you know kind of higher up the, and you want to kind of you know the self actualization. Um, why is it more challenging? Because all these forces are pushing against you, right? Human forces, just, you know, systemic forces, all kind of pushing against you. So how do you break through that? You need a team, you need a village, you need sponsors, you need mentors. We'll talk about some of those things today, I'm sure. Um, but it is hard. Like one question I would, uh, early in my career, I went to one of my mentors and I gave her a situation and I was like, am I crazy? <laughs> like, and I was gonna, that's, so that's become my like go-to question. Am I crazy in a situation? And I feel like I can deal with rational beings and irrational beings. Like I've spent my life thinking about, I've worked with a lot of folks over time between as, as a consultant, as an investment banker and other things. And I think about, am I working in a group of irrational people or rational people? And sometimes irrational people will make you think you're crazy. Like you'll look in the mirror and be like, am I, am I crazy? And I gave this to my mentor and I was waiting for her to tell me that, yeah, Carla, you're crazy. You need to do this, that, or that. And she looked at me and said, you're crazy, Carla. <laughs> like this, this is what happens, right? And it then gives you the confidence. As some people have heard the term imposter syndrome, right? Where you start to doubt, you know, your beliefs and your skills, your intellect, all these things. Um, I would always say like most of the folks that are on this call, you aren't crazy, right? And if you think maybe you're borderline, maybe you're a little crazy, talk to folks around you that you trust and respect. And they'll tell you, you know, you'll be able to ask that question. Uh, but oftentimes we're not crazy, right? So you, you'll be in this space when you're not in an inclusive culture, you will be made to think that you are crazy sometimes. And the reality is you really aren't, if you will. But you need that support system to really help you push through. The other thing, I think when the uh, when the culture at the workplace is not inclusive, like the work is five million times harder, right? Because in addition to doing what's assigned to you as part of your job responsibility, I know for me, in my um, work experience, like the code switching alone, the assimilation alone is like a full time mm -hmm. job sometimes. I, I, I haven't told this story before, but it brought to mind as you all were speaking that when I was at maybe an earlier stage of my career and I had gotten into a management role, I worked for a psychiatric adult day program. And um, at some point in that manager role, it became the unspoken rule that I didn't understand that I was mm -hmm. expected to, um, I think, um, fraternize with other managers and or directors. And I actually, at that time, was still eating lunch. I mean, I came in the role as a manager, but I found my comfort in eating lunch with more of the entry-level employees. And they weren't all Black people. They were just more like my tribe of people, right? Like more, I think, had more relative experience to me. And so I would eat lunch with them, right? Like the lower-level people. I actually got written up as a manager by my mm -hmm. director for eating lunch with people who weren't in management or above my station, even though for me, that was like the one hour of the day that I had a comfort zone, a safe space where I felt like the people, and that might've been a mix of racism and classism in their expectation of me to do that. Mm -hmm. But I think for many of us, in order to succeed in our careers, there's so much to navigate on top of being twice as good at the job. There's so much of this other stuff that you have to navigate. And it is not only harmful to your mental health, it's just harmful all the way, right? It's exhausting. Any any uh, feedback on that? Right. Chris, um, like, oh. Go ahead, no, oh, please. I'm, gonna, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna hand it to you, Chanel, because uh, well, I'll tell you, like, they oftentimes we just call that the black tax, right? Yes. Black tax, right? Of being a leader in a company, you have to do all the extra. You have to navigate, again, your own career. You gotta be there for the support as a professor, I'm sure Chanel gets her fair share of black students who are navigating the landscape and need to come to her office and have a different mm -hmm. conversation, if you will, or step out and go grab coffee or have an alcoholic beverage if needed mm -hmm. at times. I mean, all of those things play out, right? So that's a there is absolutely that notion that um is oftentimes invisible, but it's a tax, right? That you end up paying, if you will. And um, you know, that's it's it's part of the the landscape. And you and until folks, until you can kind of Get an audience to be able to share that with folks that that allies or want to be allies or or in their journey toward that spectrum of trying to become an ally. These are the conversations you end up having, so they understand and kind of, oh wow, you have to stay after and have office hours. Your office hours, is, you know, one hour, but you have to have to have office hours for three hours, right? Because you have to take on all these other students. It may not even be in your discipline, right? You know, they're not even in pharmacy. They're <laughs> they're in social work, but they need to come talk to you because that's the <laughs> only faculty member they see, if you will. It's a little right. interesting, though, because I think, and I'd love to hear your perspective, Chanel, 
um, we sometimes are conditioned to think that this is just the way it is. I know, and not until probably more recently in my career did I understand that this wasn't a Chrissy thing. It was marginalization, right? Like I, until I started to learn over the course of time the concepts of DEI and the important of, importance of inclusion, I didn't recognize those things that happened to me as disinclusion. I thought that just was how it was and that there was something I needed to improve about how I showed up in my performance. So we're really conditioned to think that mm -hmm. this is just the way work is and that many times we're not good enough and we don't necessarily even know why we don't fit in. We don't, we don't blame the culture, we tend to blame ourselves. Absolutely. And I would like to pick on that, you know, up on that idea of one, we don't know what we, we, we get this feeling that, well, one, the message that I often got was you should be glad to be here. <laughs> right. So that's one message. No one ever said it, but it's sort of like that message. You better be glad, you know, that you're here. Right. So you're just, you know, trying to not break it, you know, like that walking, walking on eggshells, trying not to break anything. Right. Because you're not sure what it is about, you know, what you're doing um, that is causing more problems, right? If you make a mistake, right, something is catastrophic and we think we might need to let you go versus someone else makes a mistake and they're thinking, is something going on at home, right? So you don't get that benefit of the doubt. And I think it's important to normalize this experience of marginalization, uh, particularly for, you know, new students, new faculty, new leaders coming into a space that this is normal, right? There are studies to show that there are ways in which um, black people, maybe people with disabilities, other ways that uh, people share identities are marginalized. They have that experience over and over again. Uh, so I think one thing that's really important is to share, right, our experience, to share our stories, you know, like Carla sharing, you're sharing yours, to share our experiences. So um, those who are new to these different spaces don't have that feeling of, is there something wrong with me, right? And that's sort of that, you know, you kind of develop this oppressed deficit mindset that is something mm -hmm. wrong with the person versus the problem is with the system. And I think as organizations, we also have can have that deficit mindset, like there's something wrong with this student or there's something wrong with this faculty member versus um, is there something wrong with our culture, right? Do we have explicit behaviors that we expect or is it sort of assumed and it's sort of driven by personality, right? And it's usually that person who's part of the dominant culture that's sort of driving that narrative, right? Do we um, reprimand all people, right, who are not um, expressing, let's say, leadership behaviors, or we only can, you know, we only see that person. So I think it's important one to normalize uh, that experience of being marginalized because when it's normal, and I understand that it's not me, I can respond in situations, right? So when I don't know what's, I always feel blindsided, uh, but when I yes. understand that this is a uh, an experience that many people of color experience across organizations, I can respond. I can choose to respond, and that is just so much power to know that I can respond, right? You can choose, I'm not gonna respond right now or I will, but you have you know, more of that uh, self agency where you can say, I can choose, right? Versus, you know, I'm just constantly being um, you know, blindsided, right? Which can you know, ruin like your whole day, right? Or, or week, however that is. So um, yeah, I think that's impor important to normalize that and it's not you. <laughs> what about people? So I got this advice that like, you can't always consume um, I think things online that agree with you, right? Like sometimes you have to look at things that, you know, differ from your own personal opinion. So I've been looking at all kinds of things, especially in this polarized election season. And someone posted on, I think it was one of the news stations posted just yesterday about how this was Black Business Month, Black Philanthropy Month. And there were people on there that were like, you know, what do these people want? How much more do they get to have? And I mean, it was the most like racist rhetoric on there. But the the to the notion of it all was like, what do they want? Like, what more do you people want? And so I lean to this question. Um, there are some people who will say, do your job and go home, right? Like, it's not the job, the company, the employer's responsibility to make you feel included or comfortable. Do what's on the job description and go home. We don't care about you being Black, gay, um, you know, disabled or anything else. Do the job and go home. So the question is, are employers responsible for inclusion? And then if you believe they are, why? You want me to start, Chanel? Yeah. Uh, yes. Definitively, <laughs> <laughs> okay. yes. Right? Yes, if, okay. If, if, like, this is the premise, right? Like, as a business leader, what do I care about, right? Like, like if the business is, or the organization, the goal is, in a public context, you know, return uh, capital to shareholders, return to shareholders. If it's a nonprofit and we want to drive towards 
programmatic outcomes we want to drive towards hopefully surplus at the end of the year. Um, it depends on what your business goals are, right? But if I want to get the best um, out of my employees, um, my goal is to create a environment where there's a strong sense of belonging, right? As someone who played a lot of sports growing up, um, I know the teams that I was on when we won, it's because we all felt like we belonged and we felt like we were on a shared mission, right? Like it, like I love diversity in the context of um, it's got to be diverse as long as we're on a shared mission, right? If it's diverse and we all are just like, what you just heard there is like, that's not a shared mission in that conversation, right? Which you read online. If we're on a shared mission and we all bring different points of view, I think we'll actually get to a better outcome if we're on that shared mission. If we're not a shared mission, everybody's rolling in different directions, right? If you will. So I think it's it's critically important to create that environment if that's your goal is to drive, again, profits to shareholders, surplus, break even, whatever your goals are. But um, I can't, you know, if I think about why I stepped into like wanting to be a leader, um, I wanted to be in a relation where I can help codify the vision, the mission, build an incredible team, get people to buy into the mission and help us build products and services that customers and partners want, right? And if everybody's aligned to that goal, we're going to actually do a lot of, uh, have great outcomes, right? But if I build something and I don't care anything about values, I don't care about it, you work nine to five and go home. Maybe I want a culture that's nine to five, right? But I still want you to give me your best in nine to five, right? I'm not going to ask you to, hey, so do all nighters, right? This isn't college, if you will. <laughs> this isn't cram session. Um, but I'll build a culture that says, aligns with, okay, I want you to have work-life balance. What do you want? Let's. It's an exchange. It's a, it's a partnership, right? If you will. Um, it may not always be equal partnership, but it's a partnership, if you will. So I think building that culture of inclusivity and belonging becomes incredibly important if you will, depending on what your outcomes are. So now thoughts? And I think also um, building up what Carla is saying is that if we create an inclusive culture, you know, I'm just thinking about this in a different way, everybody brings their best to the table, right? So if I'm more concerned about assimilating, right, uh, than getting my studies done, it's going to be very hard for me to bring my best to the table. If I'm worried about making sure what my product of work is looks just like yours, well, I'm clearly not bringing the best, you know, my best to the table. Um, and I would say for organizations, I would say certainly for our institution, we are looking at what is our mission? What are we here to do, right? Um, if our mission is to improve the health outcomes of society, how do we do that, you know, when we we don't take the culture of inclusion seriously, right? So how can I say, you know, I want you to be, um, you know, fully seen as a patient when we don't value that as a culture of the institution? So I am very, very much about making sure that the work that we do about building an inclusive culture that it is tied to our mission and the values that we say are our core values, because I think you can't kind of escape, right? You can't say, well, it's good if we, you know, treat the patients well, right? Or that customer well, but it's not, you know, good for our employees or um, students, faculty that are here. So I think it's sort of a mission critical imperative, right? And, and we see this in, um, you know, the business space and the corporate space, for example. My, my favorite example I like to use is Amazon, right? We always look at product reviews before we buy anything. And I, I know that that translates to profit. If you have a five-star review, you're more likely to have your item bought versus those who have a one or two. So I like to translate that to um, including equity, uh, including inclusion and in our mission and vision, because if we want the best you know, productivity out of people, we want the patient, uh, not the patients. Oh my goodness, I always think about patients, but we want people, you know, to feel included, feel like they can bring their best. So if we are worried about, you know, if we're concerned about workplace productivity, if we're concerned about student success, we need to be concerned that they feel like they're in an environment where, you know, they can bring their best. And lastly, you know, for, uh, for faculty, uh, particularly in uh, higher education, uh, where, um, you know, recruitment and retention of, of, of faculty of color is, is very challenging. Uh, this is how you retain faculty of color about, by building that inclusive uh, organization. So it matters so many ways for, um, you know, how we want our institutions to be effective. It, it really builds towards those goals overall. So what you all have said is very consistent with the research that says that companies and organizations have direct benefits from being inclusive, um, increased innov innovation. People are bringing their best selves, their unique perspectives to the table, they're problem solving, they're bringing solutions, and that leads to you know better outcomes for the business, um, better decision making, 
uh, improve financial performance? Because we always have to talk about the bottom line for businesses. We we talked about what are their true outcomes? Is it profitability? Is it growing the business? And if so, we know that diverse perspectives lend itself to making those things happen. At the same time in this world, we see a uh, reticence for people to stay committed to DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, right? Um, uh, companies are rolling back their investment in the work. And I would have to ask you, you know, if I'm a white professional, specifically a white man, you know, and I'm looking at diversity and inclusion initiatives as ones that undermine my footing, and my ability to grow my career, right? Power concedes nothing without a demand, then what would be my impetus to support and respect inclusion if I'm of a frame of mind that looks at it as something that unsteadies my ability to grow and to, um, I think, be dominant in an organization? That might be the age old question, but I'm, I'm asking you what your, what your thoughts are. Right. I think that is where leadership comes into play, right? Um, if the organization is, is, is serious about their mission um, and they understand how um, equity, diversity, and inclusion is connected to advancing that mission, then I think that comes from the leadership with accountability, right? Whoever you are in this institution, you don't have to um, agree, but you're going to have to align if you're holding certain roles. So let's say, you know, your, you know, leaders, um, you know, um, supervisors are, you know, really not in line with this EDI business. Uh, if you're here, you're part of the mission. And if this is part of advancing the mission, you know, this is something that is an expectation versus, because we don't want it to get to a, I feel like it, I don't feel like it. I agree, I don't agree, right? We need to leave it connected to a mission, critical mission-driven imperative. So again, we want, you know, to be productive, right? And, you, and, and sometimes you do need to share uh, the receipts, right, of, of what are the benefits of EDI, right, because there's deep research and scholarship on this in, in the academy and also in corporate spaces. So I do think we need to um, continuously be educating uh, whatever workplace or um, institutional community there is. Education, but also accountability from the leadership to say you are in this role. Um, therefore, we have some expectations around some equity metrics. So for example, um, I might not care about EDI, but I do care about student success, right? So do you just care about some student success or all? Uh, so then we, we go to that student success metric. There are actual metrics, right? What is the five-year graduation rate? And if you notice that there are inequities, that's something that needs to be addressed. And I think that can be approached from accountability so we can you know, avoid having these unproductive conversations of I agree versus I disagree. Carla? I love it, Chanel. Um, I think in general, people move off of, values and incentives, values and incentives. Either I align on the values and I'm going to make a move, right? I'm going to take an action um, or say a word, or I'm incentivized to take an action or say a word, if you will. Um, Chanel hit it out of the park, if you will. This this, this whole notion DEI, um, it's not a pipeline issue. It's not, it, it's a leadership accountability issue at the forefront, right? And oftentimes uh, the leadership problem you know, a lot of data out there that would say most managers are not actually good managers, right? Like there's a Gallup survey that basically says like, you know, 80% of managers are not good managers. I, I've had some good managers. So I don't, <laughs> I've been blessed, right? You know, and hopefully I am a good manager, but, but a lot of managers don't get the training to be good managers, right? You know, and then you perpetuate this issue. So you have issues at the leadership level, right? At the executive leadership level. And that permeates down to this middle management, which is where a lot of the, the real problems happen, right? It's not oftentimes, sometimes it's the CEO, right? And and the exec team. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes it's this middle, middle layer, right? And and all them, if you cannot have a culture where leadership, and I'm gonna put it those two layers, the management layer and the executive layer, are not in incentivized or held accountable for building a meritocracy around who gets hired, promoted, fired. All three, right? Not just how who gets hired and promoted, who gets hired, promoted. Um, and fired based on um, their performance and their competencies, right? If you can't build that structure and there's no uh, punitive, like, you know, hey, build a nice DEI program, but doesn't change my executive pay in the case you just described, Chrissy. What? And, and I don't lie on the values, right? I don't lie on the values and I'm not incentivized to move. But if I'm incentivized and I need to then think about Oh wow, my bonus is going to be cut in half if I don't do this. Oh, what do you right. guys? 
Chrissy and Chanel, well, let me hear what you have. Let me hear it. <laughs> Teach me the way. Show me the way to get my 100% of my bonus, right? You know, um, so that's that's the game. And some companies and some organizations put their money where their mouth is around that. And some don't, right? You know, and that's the, the reality. So we heard it here first, right? Uh, organizations who have a lack of commitment to DEI, we're putting the ownership of that on executive level leadership and middle managers. We heard, we've said that today and we the three of us agree on that. And so we have allies on who are representing organizations and we wanna make sure that that's clear um, that the uh, steps to building cultures of inclusion start at that leadership level. So let's uh, transition to that. So we have some organizations here who maybe are doing a little bit of the work, uh, maybe are vacillating, maybe are trying to figure out where to start. Um, what are some of the steps that an organization should should take to build a culture of inclusion? I'd love to give a few of them. The first is to be open about addressing bias, like call a thing a thing, right? Like let's start to call out um, some of the things that are happening in the organization so that you can either be trained to overcome it or put measures in place to overcome it. What other things do, if an organization's here and saying we're ready and open, what do we do? Um, do they need to do? I can start um, because we've actually gone through um, this process over the past year, well, actually, actually the past several years um, in my organization to really think about um, what does institutionalization of equity, diversity, and inclusion really look like around here on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think I would put it into three categories um, if you're getting started, right? Capacity building, right? We were just talking about leadership. Uh, sometimes there's education that's required. There's coaching, like hand in hand, like, well, what does equity, diversity, inclusion have to do uh, with me as an alumni, you know, a professional, right? What does that have to do with me? Um, so there is some capacity building education from the leadership level, um, those who are people managers and, and just the general workforce, right? So capacity building. Uh, the second is uh, strategic planning, right? Uh, mm -hmm. We create strategic plans around most things in organizations. There should be a strategic plan uh, for us to advance our um, equity, diversity, and inclusion goals or whatever acronym you might use um, in a way that, again, is building towards the mission. Again, inextricably tied to the mission. Um, and then lastly, I think having an infrastructure to support this. Um, not a person or a team that's supporting it for the whole organization, but because we are all here for the mission, one, one guiding principle we have for our strategic plan is equity is part of our mission, then equity should be part of everyone's work. While that may look different um, for uh, different roles in the organization, that makes it school-wide, right? So we need an infrastructure beyond, you know, this group of, you know, a few professionals, right? So it needs to be school-wide and that infrastructure needs to be done in a very thoughtful way and it will take time, right? Um, this work is not going to happen quickly, but I think if you do it, content, you know, intentionally, uh, and strategically, you know, it's something that can be institutionalized. Yes. Carlo, any other yeah. steps? Yeah, I would, I mean, uh, Chanel hit hit it really. The, you know, I think about this is like anything that an organization wants to accomplish, like it starts with like an idea, right? Okay, we want to accomplish the thing. You set a goal. I, I'm a big fan of like narrative, like put it out on paper and let people digest it and let's talk through it, if you will. Um, but being able to set your intention, again, tying it back to Chanel said to the mission of the organization is really important. And then you start to think about, you know, some version of implementation and measurement. And oftentimes, like, it starts with like, do we have a problem? Like, is there is there an issue that, that, that exists, right? And that can come from both quantitative and qualitative. So look at the data, if you will, right? What are your employees saying, right? And and I I would listen to them <laughs> um, um, as much as possible and have dialogue, right? Not just listen, you know, do a survey and then kind of compile it, but engage in dialogue, focus groups, et cetera. Um, then there's data relative that if you look at, you know, progression rates, meaning kind of like who gets promoted, you know, kind of an organization, you can kind of measure those things, right? And go back in history. You can look at attrition rates, like, hey, are the folks that are leaving the org, are there disparities in terms of, you know, black and brown folks, right? Or other types of, you know, diversity, however you want to measure it. Um, but you can kind of look at those things. And then you realize like, well, what do we need to put in place? Okay, we have a problem, Houston. Now, what do we do about it, right? And I think that's where you have to get, you know, smart minds around the company to really think about it. And again, it's not just putting one DEI person in the org and saying, you go figure it out. It has to be, um, going back to the leadership accountability, it has to be owned by the leaders of the organization. You may have someone who's guiding and steering things, if you will, but, you know, 
the CTO, right, chief tech, you know, te technology officer, oftentimes uh, of a tech company in, in Silicon Valley is oftentimes not the person showing up on CNBC to talk about the, right. what's built, right? You know, you have um, uh, any number of CEOs like Mark Zuckerberg or otherwise who are the ones who are kind of staying on stage, right? You know, if you will. So uh, you don't, you don't, that's owned by the CEO, right? It's owned by the leader of the organization as the one who's going to be the face and speak to these things, not let me hand it to, you know, uh, Chanel or Carlo mm -hmm. to, to really help drive it. Now, again, in partnership, absolutely. I, um, mm -hmm. CEO of, of my last company, we, you know, in the mm -hmm. middle of George Floyd, we, we did an AMA together, right? I'll ask me anything kind of for all of our employees, 5,000 employees across the, the, the continent, if you will. And that was fair. Like we talked about it in advance, I signed up for it and we were able to kind of digest it because there might be things I can speak to that of my lived experience that he may not be able to speak to, right? Right, right, man, right? you know, and um, so sometimes you can do things in partnership, but if he said, Carlo, I need you to be on stage by yourself, right? I, no, you need to come do this work, right? Mm -hmm. I can do this work. I can, I can do take the AMA all day long, but you need to be here with, with me. But he didn't say that. He said, Carlo, will you join me in partnership on this thing? Let's talk through it, right? And I think that is the, the way you go about doing it. But you need that ownership and that accountability, if you will, um, kind of from the top to help drive it. And we talk about more specific plans. I'm happy to chat offline about mm -hmm. specific plans, but that is how we drive it. And I love that you talked about actually listening. I don't think enough organizations engage in that with their employee base because one of the biggest ways you can get to inclusion is by simply asking for feedback, asking people what they need to be fulfilled at work. Carl? Well, see, it really quickly, just what you said about sitting at the lunch table, right? Oh. I cannot tell you that, you know, I people that have worked with me, um, yes, maybe I know a little, a few things. I've been to a couple of schools, but I never look at myself as the smartest person in the room. I, and I can learn from anybody. It's mm -hmm. not just the other executives around the table. I will go, I've learned so much from the individual contributor who just started, the intern, right? Who has a different way of looking at things. And that's the whole diversity notion, right? Like you're an intern, you just got here two weeks ago and you've already seen mm -hmm. this gap in something we're doing, right? And we have all been here for the past year and right. you've been here two weeks. That insight is so critical. So I am like, you know, intern asked me for lunch. I'm like, let's go to lunch because, <laughs> because and it's a two way street. They're like, they want to learn whatever the career insights that I can share and I'm learning from them. But that listening aspect, and you're absolutely right. A lot of folks in leadership don't listen, if you will. Right. And they, listen. we know best. Right. They, partially, I, they don't want to hear the, the truth and the answer. Okay. Right. Because then they have okay. to do something about it. But I think people um, can tell you what they need. They can talk about what feels uncomfortable and they can give you when we talk about what are the steps, they can give you some of the steps to improve if you're willing to hear from them. Um, I have to give a, a shameless plug because I just have to. But one of the other things I think organizations who want to be more inclusive should do is to seek outside support. Um, mm -hmm. I know a lot of organizations have kind of divested in having their equity professionals on staff. They don't have the resources to keep those things in place. But there are, are organizations like ABC and, and many others who do this uh, training and equity work and can step in with a level of expertise that does not exist in the company, but also does not burden current employees. And so one of the reasons I've always vacillated around employee resource groups, and I believe when done correctly, they can be great, but I believe in other circumstances, they put the burden of change on the people who are harmed. And those people do not have the bandwidth typically or the expertise. Just because I'm Black does not mean I'm in your organization and I can bring forward solutions for all Black people. And so I think organizations should be open to engaging with outside expertise. And ABC is just one organization that offers that kind of workshopping and training. And I just wanted to bring forward a tool that we have. I didn't develop it. It's been longstanding at ABC called ABC's 10 Essential Questions. And we workshop this as facilitators, as practitioners of racial equity work with organizations who want to be more inclusive. And we ask these questions and we determine, have you, are you, have you not started at all? Are you progressing or have you, you know, arrived at where you need to be? And I think it's a critical look at why outside organizations who do consulting work are super important. Any thoughts about that? Yes, yes, and yes. Okay. <laughs> well, I love to hear that. <laughs> I want to move on really, really quickly to uh, empower our viewers, right? We may have Black professionals on. I know we do. We And I also see that we have some allied people who I believe are invested in helping Black communities and Black professionals. And so we want to talk about what people, as an individual, what can I do to push this work forward quicker, not just at my own organization, but in, you know, in advocacy uh, work, you know, completely? What? How can I stand up? 
and be on the right side of making sure that uh, businesses, corporations, community organizations, and everywhere that Black people exist become more inclusive. So I'd love to hear your, hear your thoughts around that. So I can start, um, you know, with a couple, you know, I think, I always think on different levels, depending on, well, who the audience is, right? So for example, if you are currently a professional, you know, talking to those who are, you know, kind of coming behind you and coming into that professional space, sharing your story, right? It is incredibly powerful because sometimes when you get to a place of you've been doing something for many years, people think, well, I just, you know, you just happen to show up there. So I think one important thing is making you share your story to encourage and 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 help others who are you know coming behind you in a similar space uh, to encourage them to continue to move forward in whatever story right they have. Um, I think you know also if there is a way to get involved in professional organizations where the work is being done right it could be just in committee where you're doing some specific thing I think that's a wonderful way to get involved, especially if you don't have a ton of bandwidth, right, to um, spend a lot of time on it. So that's a really great way uh, to get involved um, with different organizations that are doing work and probably in the area that uh, that you're um, that you're in as a professional. And again, if you're a Black professional, I would imagine that sometimes you are underrepresented there. So getting involved in professional organizations that have these sort of affinity groups or have some strategic plan um, that is moving the work forward, I think that's excellent. Um, if you have a little bit more bandwidth, uh, but I think you, if you have a little more bandwidth, and by bandwidth, I mean, if you're in a position in your career to do extra and other things, right, not where you just got here, right? And they say, oh, look, there goes, uh, you know, some a person of color, maybe they want to be leading that committee. I always advise against doing that, especially if you just got in your career, you know, you have not built up that level of influence um, yet to, to really move things forward. So if you're kind of new to a space, my advice, you know, that's, uh, that I give to people who sort of just got in the space is don't go full on, you know, heading a committee. You're here to advance, right? So if it's a trainee, I'm saying what you need to do is uh, get the degree, right? Um, if you're just a new faculty member, assistant professor, you need to get promoted. That is your equity, diversity, and inclusion work, right? So if you are in, if you're in a space, right, you're more advanced associate professor or you're, you know, more advanced in your career, yes then it makes sense to take on that role because you have relationships to go on. You have more influence within an organization. So um, so I would give different advice <laughs> to different the people. Oh, depending. we appreciate mm -hmm. that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Carlo, your advice? How we yeah. can be better advocates? Yeah. So um, I think about like careers and like there's a dichotomy between kind of like your life up to about age 18 in the U.S., right? Maybe 16 in the uh, Caribbean, the West Indies. Um, but but Chrissy, I'm gonna ask you a question. When if you got when you got when you got not if when you got all A's in eleventh grade, what happened the next year? What do you mean? I well, I I grew up in a household where nothing but an A was allowed and expected. So right. So you got uh, all A's in eleventh yeah, grade. Then you what had to, then you had to get A's the next year too. So you you advanced. You went to the twelfth yeah, grade. You went to the next year. Yeah. 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 In your career, it doesn't work that way. No, it absolutely work, not. Right. And there's like a, you can, this, this phenomenal thing you think about that most folks don't land on, especially early career folks, is you, and even in the context of professor, um, you know, if you're on tenure track, you cannot get yourself promoted. You cannot get yourself promoted. You need a village around you to help you get promoted, right? And I think that's a, a lot of folks that come out of college and they're like, well, what, wait a minute, hold on. I, I did, I got A's and all work. my work. Yeah. I got A's and all my work. <laughs> Why didn't I, I got, why did I get passed over for the promotion, right? And I think the earlier you think about that you need these champions behind closed doors that are going to help you navigate your career. I call, you know, I call the personal board of directors. I've kind of had that for a long time, but but I think there's really three roles that are really important. Having, you know, kind of advisor, mentor, and sponsor. I'm going to define them really quickly. Advisor is somebody that I can go to and ask like a very discreet question, if you will. So I want to know how to do, I'm an investment banker. And I don't know how to do a this kind of cash flow state, you know, this kind of cash flow analysis. Who can I call as an advisor? I'm not calling a manager. I don't want to call the partner. I want to call somebody that can help me with that that DCF model, right? And I can call that person anytime to be asked. Or you want to learn how to do a podcast? You call your advisor. Your mentor is somebody you give good, bad, ugly, right? I can come to them. The focus is all about you. It's somebody you can trust, and they're giving you the good, bad, and ugly. You can say, 
am I crazy? And I can tell you, yes, you are crazy or no, you aren't, right? Um, and then the sponsor is, oh, that is such a special role, right? And I think all of us have probably paid sponsors kind of in our, our time. Those are the individuals that um, they have to choose you. You don't choose a sponsor. You can't walk up to somebody and say, can you sponsor me? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> they choose you. They usually see some glimmer of light, right? You showing up, you got A's like Chrissy did. <laughs> and, and, and they say, oh, oh I want Chrissy. You're on special. My <laughs> <laughs> You're special, right? Um, and they're going to spend their valuable um, political capital and social capital uh, in the workplace, oftentimes, to help carry your name and carry your interest in the room, right? Those people are fantastic. And sometimes they're in the workplace. Sometimes they're sponsoring you to your next thing, if you will. So building these relationships is critically important, you know, kind of as you navigate your career. Um, I was early in my career and I, I didn't follow Chanel's advice. I apologize. <laughs> but I got involved. I got asked to join uh um, to show up at a NAVA meeting, that's what your black accountants meeting. I'm not an accountant, by the way. I'm a business person, I'm a tech person, but I was not an accountant. I show up to a meeting at, uh, I'm at Deloitte, so that's that's probably why I got pulled into this thing. They're like, show up to this meeting, I meet the president of the chapter. Um, within a matter of weeks, I, you know, we had a couple of conversations. He's like, I want you to run for vice president next year. Um, I was like, oh, okay, all right. I run for vice president, I get the role, then I move on to president. And that network in NAVA became a national network that I was like, man, I had so many insights about what's happening kind of in this broader industry. And allow me to, this is actually the the, the, the more personal ask, allow me to work on things, right? Where can I go work on things outside of the workplace and bring it back on Monday, right? You know, into the workplace. So public speaking, I, I, I ran from public speaking as a high school student, right? I was like, oh, I don't not want to do a speech in high school. And then now you can put me on stage with thousands of people and it's all good, right? How did I do that? Like, that was working on a thing, looking at where are my gaps, being self-aware and saying, okay, I need to work on this. So let me get involved in this organization. Now I got to speak to like our board. I got to speak to our members when we show up to a NABA function. And over time, that all has translated to me doing a bunch of other amazing things in the career. But it was looking at these deficits and saying, where can I go? Where's my playground to go work on that? And then bring that back into my career, if you will. So that was my only thing I would say in terms of getting involved in certain things, getting involved in the workplace versus outside the workplace, you could actually build some skills out here adjacent to your career that actually end up accelerating oh, your career. Yeah. Along. So I just want to add before I give you all the opportunity to make some final remarks, as we're talking about specifically what Black professionals can do to push inclusion and to advocate for it, um, I would hope that people have come to know me as being very direct and to say things that need to be said. I, my board chair, to, chair is on the webinar today, so you can't go back and say what I said. He's going to hear it for himself. But I want to look... <laughs> Um, Black professionals in the eye and say this, and, and I think this is critically important. Um, tokenism is a weapon of mass destruction, right? Mm -hmm. And solidarity is a hell of a thing. And I think one of the things that we can do to be advocates for this work and allies to one another as Black professionals is to not stand as obstacles for one another in the workplace. I know it, there's a whole theory about Black professionalism where we're put in positions and in places, and then we are under-resourced and not given decision-making power. And the next likely thing that typically happens is that we're pit and put against one another. And in that scenario, none of us win. The, the inclusion doesn't matter because, you know, we can tend to have one person that's tokenized and is in a position of power and authority mm -hmm. and the light is shown on that one person while the rest of the people of color in the workplace tend to struggle. And so if I was giving advice to Black professionals, just having navigated my own experience and been compared to other Black, black professionals who maybe were more complacent and compliant than I showed up as, mm -hmm. don't stand in the way of your brother and your sister. We have to do this work together and in solidarity. So there, there I am, I'm a military. I'm direct. I'm saying it. I'm looking you in the eye and saying it. And with that, I would love first to thank both of you for being on the webinar today, but then give you the opportunity to give some closing remarks and some guidance and some resources maybe to those who are joining us on the importance of building inclusive culture as corporations and any suggestions you have on navigating cultures that might not be as, a, as inclusive as we want them to be today. And so we'll start with Carlo and end with Chanel. Yeah. Chrissy, the, the, on your last comment, uh, my mom always tells me like that, Carl, there's no competition on a spiritual plane, no yeah. competition on a spiritual plane. So I'm not worried about anybody <laughs> to, to the, to the left or right of me in terms of competition, if you will. My job, as I said, you know, 
I think about lifting as we climb. I want to lift people around me, right? So that's where I focus my that's what time. We gotta do. Spending time thinking about who am I competing against, if you will, because no one has the unique set of skills, talents, humor, et cetera, that Carl Young has, right? So that's that's a that's one element. If I think about the inclusivity aspect, that also then plays into you need a Chrissy, a Chanel, a Carlo, a Bernard, a Amber, a Tony in the room to really bring all these unique skill sets. You said it earlier, we're not a monolith. Black people are not a monolith, right? Um, and I think it's important to think about how do we get as many folks in the room and at the table to help um, really drive, again, innovation, better outcomes, you know, smarter decisions, you know, better insight, perspective. I just, this, this whole gamut of things that just, Oftentimes, if I'm sitting in the room as Chanel, sometimes you're, you're, again, you're the only one in the room and you realize, like, there's so much missing from this conversation, right? Mm -hmm. You, like, completely have excluded this audience over here that mm -hmm. really, you know, um, I, one last story, like, so we launched More House Online, um, again, this online undergraduate degree completion program, and, you know, kind of went to our marketing team and said, we need to target Black women for this program. And people looked at me like I was crazy. They're like, why, why? This is a single gender male institution in Atlanta, Georgia. Why would we target Black women for this um, for this program? And set with our marketing team. And I said, well, you don't obviously have perspective on the Black women and their role in the lives of Black men as spouses, you know, mothers, sisters, friends, et cetera. And uh, we had outsized results. And that first cohort, excuse me, had 220 Black men show up. Um, in this first cohort in fall 21. And if you listen to the stories of many of these gentlemen, um, how they navigated the program, how they learned about the program was through some influential woman, in the, Black woman in their life, if you will. So that perspective would have been lost in a room of folks that would just have not, you know, it's a, you know, it's Black men. I don't yeah. <laughs> right, as opposed to understand the context of that narrative, if you will. So that's why we need more voices in the room, more perspectives mm -hmm. in the room to drive better outcomes, if you will. So that was a business imperative um, that, that uh, led to outsized business gains, but um, but required a diverse perspective. Thank you. Chanel? Yes, and I will share from, you know, the perspective of really understanding who you are, right? And and what what makes you uniquely you, right? And, and you're in these spaces often, and I'm often speaking to Black professionals who might be the only or one of the few in said leadership role on, in an academic institution. And I think we have to get used to the narrative in our own head if we don't hear it around in that space that you belong here, right? And it sounds like a small thing, but it's like you belong here. Your voice is important here. Your voice matters, right? So one, it has to be some internal kind of leadership development to really understand what it, is, what it is that drives you, understand that your talents, your skills, you didn't get here by chance. You certainly didn't get here by chance, right? You did the work, you are here, but a lot of times you kind of have to encourage yourself when you're in these spaces where it may not yet be an inclusive culture um, to make sure that you are very clear on who you are and whatever voices and, and messages you hear, you are here and you are valued, even though that may not always be uh, reflected to you. So I think that's one. Um, also getting yourself into community. Uh, and again, speaking to those who may not yet be in that inclusive um, kind of environment, building your community outside, right, of that organization if you need to, right, that will speak to you and say, girl, you're not crazy. You're not crazy, right? Um, this is a real experience that you're having, acknowledging that, but also helping you to move forward. Yes, you're having that experience. And now what, right? Is this something that you believe that your gifts and talents are still valued here or maybe you need to think about um thinking about a career move right i that's think right. that's a real conversation <laughs> that you need to be able to have with people who love you and care for you and are going to be honest with you right you don't always have to just you know keep on taking one for you know whatever team um and then also you being there again particularly in the spaces that are may not be, yet be as inclusive people see you that that, um, you know, people see you and they kind of, you know, they're looking up to you. They might not always say it, uh, but for example, when I was here for years, you know, would, you know, be some of the hourly staff would say, I'm so glad you're here. I'm rooting for you. And that just meant, you know, it meant so much to me, but you don't realize how that student sees you. They may not say it, but they start to feel like they belong because you're there, right? So I think there's so many ways um, in which we create um, more inclusive environments just by us 
being there, but really thinking about what do you have uniquely to contribute and are you making a difference, right? And if not, uh, sometimes thinking about where where else might my uh, gifts and talents be uh, be better used and employed, yeah. Thank you both so much. I uh, appreciate you for sharing not only your lived experiences, but your insights. And you guys dropped some gems on us today. And hopefully everyone who watched today and who's watching the playback can uh, gain as much insight as I have on the webinar. So thank you both for being here for thank Associated you. Black Charities. I'm uh, looking forward to having all of you join us next month, September, where our topic for equity at work will be inclusive language and communication. And for Associated Black Charities, I'm Chrissy Thornton. See you later. Thank you. Thank well, you. Take care.